GLS is go for ET LH2 pressurization. Terminating the LH2 replenish as, as part of that operation. T minus one minute, 30 seconds. One minute, 20 seconds. Sound suppression water system is armed. Solid rocket booster joint heater is being deactivated, going into a final check of solid rocket booster commanding. Joint heater's off. Box fill and drain valves are closed. Light data recorders for the SRBs activated. Middle bay vent doors. Close three minus 31 seconds. The handoff has occurred to Space Shuttle Endeavors on board computers. Twenty. Fifteen. Firing Jane armed. T ten. minus ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Go for engine start. Four. Three. Two. One, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavour, expanding the International Space Station while creating a classroom in space. Roger, roll, Endeavour. Houston now controlling the flight of Endeavour. The Space Shuttle begins its journey back into orbit. Endeavour rolling onto the proper alignment, heads down, rings level for the eight and a half minute run to orbit. Range trackers now from a camera on the external fuel tank showing the bird's eye view of Endeavour heading towards space. 54 seconds into the flight, Endeavour already eight miles downrange, standing by for the throttle up call from Capcom Chris Ferguson. Endeavour, go with throttle up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Scott Kelly, joined on the flight deck by pilot Charlie Hobaugh, flight engineer Rick Mastracchio and Tracy Caldwell, Dave Williams, Al Drew, and Barbara Morgan seated down on the mid deck, Morgan racing towards space on the wings of a legacy. One minute, 30 seconds into the flight, Endeavour currently traveling almost 2,000 miles an hour, 14 miles in altitude, 15 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Three good fuel cells, three good auxiliary power units, three good main engines. Endeavour flying straight as an arrow, one minute, 55 seconds into the flight, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. Booster officer confirms staging a good solid rocket booster separation, guidance now converging. Endeavour's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming Endeavour for a precise keyhole in space for main engine cutoff. Two minutes, 25 seconds into the flight. The propulsion officer reports the orbital maneuvering system engines have ignited, providing Endeavour with a kick in the pants for the next minute and a half, assisting the shuttle and its crew on its climb to orbit. Endeavour, 40 miles in altitude, 59 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, traveling more than 3,400 miles an hour. Three minutes into the flight, Endeavour, 75 miles downrange, 
traveling almost 4,000 miles an hour, 47 miles in altitude. All of its systems looking good. Endeavor flying on the singular power of its three liquid fuel main engines, draining a half a ton of fuel per second from the shuttle's fuel tank. Coming up on the point of negative return where the shuttle will be too far downrange, too high an altitude to return to the launch site in the event of an engine failure. Endeavour currently 135 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, flying true. Endeavour, negative return. Negative return. Passing four minutes into the flight, Endeavour more than 60 miles in altitude, 160 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, traveling 5,000 miles an hour. All systems looking very good. The environmental systems officer reports a good flash evaporator system has been activated aboard Endeavour, providing cooling for the avionics until payload bay door opening. Four and a half minutes into the flight, 63 miles in altitude, 200 miles downrange for Endeavour. Coming up on the five minute mark into the flight, keep the shot up when you open our mic. Cells, three good auxiliary power units, Endeavour, clean as a whistle. Endeavour, press to ATO. Press to ATO. That call from Capcom Chris Ferguson indicating that even in the event of an engine failure, we can make our minimal orbital altitude targets. However, all three, three main engines continue to function normally. Endeavour currently traveling 8,000 miles an hour, 67 miles in altitude, 300 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Endeavour, single engine OPS 3. Single engine OPS 3. Guidance officer here in Mission Control confirming that Endeavour's computers are commanding the main engines to swivel again, enabling the shuttle to roll to a heads-up position above its fuel tank. This will enable Endeavour to gain better communications through the tracking and data relay satellite system heading uphill. Endeavour, press to Miko. That call indicating that even in the event of an engine failure, we can make normal orbital cutoff targets. Endeavour looking very fine right now. Three good main engines, three good fuel cells, three good auxiliary power units. Traveling more than 11,000 miles an hour, 66 miles in altitude, almost 500 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Seven minutes into the flight, about 90 seconds of powered flight remaining for Endeavour and its crew. Go for the plus X, go for the pitch. Okay, single engine plus 104, nominal shutdown, go for the plus X, go for the pitch. That call indicating uh, for Commander Scott Kelly his plan of attack uh, once Endeavour is off of the fuel tank. Seven and a half minutes into the flight, the main engine soon will throttle down to limit the stress on the shuttle and its seven crew members to that of three times the effect of gravity. Endeavour currently traveling more than four miles per second. At the time of main engine cutoff, Endeavour will enter its preliminary orbit at a speed of five miles per second.
Endeavour currently traveling at uh, 15,000 miles an hour. 20 seconds of powered flight remaining, standing by for main engine cutoff, which will be followed a few seconds later by the separation of the external fuel tank. Booster officer confirms main engine cutoff. Standing by for external tank separation. External tank separation confirmed. Endeavor now in its preliminary orbit for Barbara Morgan and her crewmates. Class is in session. Commander Scott Kelly now maneuvering Endeavour to the correct orientation so that video and digital stills of the fuel tank can be captured by cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well. Copy. Nominal Miko. Ohms 1 is not required. A smooth and uneventful climb to orbit for Endeavour and its seven crew members heading for what could be two weeks in space and a visit to the International Space Station with docking planned for Friday afternoon. Coming up momentarily, astronauts Tracy Caldwell and Dave Williams will begin video documentation and photography of that discarded fuel tank. Endeavour will be about 1,450 feet away from the tank at that time. Greg Dobbs and three-time shuttle astronaut Sam Gamar are back with you. Sam, right now they're floating. That's, Zero G. Uh, that's right. I mean, it's a picture-perfect countdown, a picture-perfect launch, and right now they're safely on orbit, which is good news for everybody, good news for the crew, good news for families, good news for NASA. And NASA's commentator just said that uh, right away uh, Tracy Caldwell and Dave Williams are going to videotape and photograph the separation of the external fuel tank and eventually downlink that back to planet Earth. They don't even get out of their space suits. Uh, do they do that in those bulky suits, or do no. they get out of them first? Right, no, they'll stay in their suits until they get to go for orbit. Now, technically, that's the plan. Some of them on the mid-deck will start to get out of their suits now. As soon as we get to main engine cutoff, they've already unbuckled. Everybody is now floating except for the pilot, the commander, and probably the lead mi uh, mission specialist, MS-2, the lead flight engineer. They'll stay in their suits. Uh, everybody else will start to get out, but Dave and, um, and Trace will start to, uh, to do the photography as part of the uh, on-orbit investigation to make sure we haven't had any tile damage or any shedding of any foam on the external tank during ascent. They were actually free of the threat of a collision with foam that would do any damage about uh, two minutes and 15 or 20 seconds into the flight when, when, when they were far enough out of the atmosphere that a collision just wouldn't have done any damage. We're going to show you a replay of that dramatic launch, and as many times as you've seen it and three times you've flown it, it never gets old. No, I never, I never tire of watching this. Now that, right now they're burning off any toxic or explosive gases in those 6.6 .6 seconds before they actually lift off. That's right. Main engines have to be up here at 100% thrust before they release the hold down post, before they fire solid rocket boosters. Again, at that moment when the solid rocket boosters fire, you've unleashed close to 7 million pounds of thrust on this spacecraft, going to lift the 4.4 million pounds to orbit. Now, as we're looking through the roll program here, at the end of the roll program, that spacecraft is going 1,000 miles an hour, 18 seconds into the flight. Well, the statistics are all mind-boggling. This is a dramatic shot just before blast-off from the White Room. The arm had been retracted. You're going to see the vibration. That's not any always... place you'd want to be on launch day. It's always amazing that, you know, how little damage they actually see out here on the launch pad after, uh, after a liftoff. It just takes them a few days to, to just make some nominal repairs, but it's very minimal. And to think that what we're watching right now happened to just under 13 minutes ago. They are already traveling at 17,600 and some odd miles per hour. They're already in space. Yeah, they'll come back around the Earth and they'll arrive back here over the Kennedy Space Center before we've left the facility tonight. <laughs>
Well, each orbit is all of 91 minutes. 91 minutes. People be stuck in traffic for three hours getting back to Orlando tonight. They'll have made two passes overhead. That will occur about 45 minutes into the flight to... Uh, but now, at this stage, when you're riding the rocket, you feel it, right? I mean, well, yeah, right now, for the first two minutes, they're, they're vibrating like they're in a blender. This is a rough ride right now. It's loud, it's, it's noisy, uh, or I should say it's, it's loud, it's, it's a rough ride. But notice, during that trajectory there, there, there was very little upper level wind. In other words, that it was just straight as an arrow, uh, as they pointed out earlier. Uh, there's just no upper level winds here. You don't see any wind shear at all. Uh, as they uh, as they rode this uh, rocket uphill today. Well, I'm not sure I'll ask the control room to tell me whether this is a live shot of the launch pad or a shot taken just moments after liftoff. My guess is that it's just moments after liftoff uh, being replayed because it clears pretty darn fast when you consider all the vapors, all the, uh, the smoke and heat and debris. Yeah. And after the payload bay doors are open, uh, the astronauts... Uh, okay, once again, we're going to show you liftoff. This camera's only about 150 yards encased in steel. Thick optical glass and in You can see it. it heaving against the hold down post. Now it's finally released. But again, for, uh, for Barbara Morgan and this crew, this, this was a fulfillment of a, of a promise today. Now, the one thing that television, even in high definition, doesn't convey as we see it with the naked eye is just how bright that flame coming out of the tail of the rocket really is. Yeah, it's blindingly bright. It's like looking at the sun. Yeah, the other thing that you can't capture on high definition TV is the emotion of the workforce here. Uh, everybody out here today, as the solid rocket boosters drop off, everybody applauds. Uh, we know that's the most dangerous part of the ascent. It's all dangerous, but that's the most extreme part of the ascent. And everybody's relieved to uh, to see first stage complete and continue on orbit on the main engines. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think Mike Mullane in his book Riding Rockets made the comment, and it's it's amazing that when you think about it, that right now, for every beat of their heart, for every heartbeat that crew is traveling five miles. <laughs> to think that when Lewis and Clark, just over 200 years ago, set out to, and this is all replay, by the way, we are now 16 minutes into the flight, but when they set out to explore America west of the Mississippi, it took them three years to get to the west coast and back. <laughs> down the hall from the shuttle flight control room here at the Johnson Space Center. Now explain, because this is in the, the first minutes of flight, that it's rolled over onto its backside. They are hanging literally upside down. They're still in a gravity environment. Why is that? Yeah, it's, it's for a couple of reasons. I mean, it, you don't necessarily have to plan your trajectories this way, but that's the way we chose to do it. Uh, that, that first roll prog program puts you in the orbital, tra in the entry trajectory for the, in the insertion orbit, but it also puts the, gives you a heads down attitude, and that allows the crew for contingency abort purposes to have visual, visible horizon should we need to, uh, to fly a contingency abort. Again, you wouldn't have to necessarily design the, the profile that way, but they did choose to do it uh, for shuttle. Now, they will roll to heads up during the course of the, the um, ascent. Today, I was looking at that roll to heads up. It's about 13,000 uh, uh, feet per second or so when they rolled back to a heads up attitude for the separation. And there is launch pad 39A, which will be the primary launch pad for each of the remaining 12 shuttle missions. I think 11 going to the International Space Station to finish building it out for further exploration in space. And one to extend the life of the Hubble telescope. That's a mission that was added earlier this year to the schedule by the administrator of NASA, and they're going to perform that next year. Well, and, and, and as well, they want to preserve two contingency flights to put additional spare parts on orbit before we retire the, the shuttle. So again, uh, you've got the 11 plus one to, to Hubble plus the two contingency, yep. and I think they'll fly all 14. It's due to come to an end in September 
2010. Now here you see a shot taken, as you can see, just a few seconds before liftoff. You can see the countdown clock. These are all NASA workers who we'll go out to see what they've contributed Now you can to. see the shaft of light. The, the flames coming out of the back end of that rocket right now are over 500 feet long. So they're riding a 500-foot flame to space today. Tell us what they're doing right now. We are uh, 18 and a half minutes into what will be, if they don't extend, just under 11 days long. Sure, they're completing the photography uh, again of the external tank. Um, the mid-deck crew is starting to get out of their seats or already has gotten out of their seats. One of the first things they're gonna activate, uh, they've been in these suits a long time. The waste containment station, as soon as they get a go for, for activation, they will. Also again, known as the toilet. As that's right. And, Waste uh, activation station. And so again, that that's going to be a big part. But uh, but right now, it's mostly just preparing for on-orbit operations and getting settled in to the next 12 or 14 days, depending on the extension. Now, other flights have been extended, but in this case, it will be good news because it will mean that a brand new system being used for the first time is working. It's called the station to shuttle power transfer system they came up with the acronym spitz and it will allow the space shuttle which has limited electrical capacity to feed off the electrical capacity of the international space station and probably uh, be able to stay for three days more than it otherwise would have and that will be a very important component of future missions through the year 2010. yeah what that what that system does is uh, the space station is 120 volt ac the um, the shuttle is 28 volt AC or alternating current, so it converts the power and preserves the consumables on board, the hydrogen and oxygen that we would normally use uh, for fuels or for the fuel cell in the in the development of our energy up there or electricity. It allows us to preserve that and, as you say, extend that mission. Very important point. Uh, in the coming next a few flights. Now the highlights coming up on this mission are of course the dramatic spacewalks on days four, six, and eight. And if they extend, there'll be a fourth spacewalk on day 10. Thursday of next week, teacher in space Barbara Morgan will spend uh, six hours on a long down link to students here on planet Earth, uh, the primary group of students in Boise, Idaho, south of the town where she kind of grew up and earned her legs as a professional school teacher. I've got to comment Sam, as you know, I came here yesterday directly from Shanghai, China, <laughs> and it took me 30 hours door to door. I left Shanghai, and 30 hours later, I was here in Cocoa Beach, Florida. In about 20 minutes, the astronauts will be over Asia once again. Not yep. over China, but over Asia. 45 minutes door to door, no problem. So good luck to the astronauts. Good luck to the some 17,000 people who contribute to the flight of every space shuttle. And Thank you to everybody here at HDNet for contributing to this live broadcast. We'll be back for the landing of the space shuttle. If they don't extend, that will be Sunday, a week and a half from now, on the 19th. And if they do, it will be three days later on Wednesday, two weeks from now. For all of us at HDNet, and on the behalf of everybody who's very thrilled at NASA here at the Kennedy Space Center, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time the shuttle comes in to land. I'm Greg Dobbs. Good night.